great time this morning. Okay. 
your love from heaven fill me till I overflow Lord I want more reach down your hand from heaven pull me closer than ever before Lord I want praising him this morning because he is an awesome great God you may be seated for just a moment as we're here this morning as we're still seeking God's face and seeking revival and praying for revival in Sunday school or we're, we're looking at the war room video and, and, and going through some of the things that were in the movie that were so powerful and one of those things we talked about this morning being having an accountable friendship um, that person may be someone in your family it could be someone that is a friend that is outside of your family, someone you trust explicitly. But we all need those people. We need someone that we can turn to and that we can, we can confide in. And so this morning as we, as we kind of move into just another part of the service, and we did a song a couple weeks ago, and um, just basically your love never fails. It's a Jesus culture song, but his love never fails. Nothing can separate, even if we run away. If we're saved and he has us in his grasp, we can try to move and we can try to run away, but he's always there and he's pulling us and calling us back. And sometimes it's just that countable friendship that he chooses to use that person to pull us back and to bring us back into the fold where we need to be. And so as we're going forward, and last week we came forward and, and we kind of prayed around the altar and some different things. And for the next few weeks, we're gonna have different forms and, and mindsets maybe of prayer. And so this morning, what I want to do is, is we sing this next song. Uh, I want you to find someone in, in your area, maybe, just two or three different people that you can just kind of gather around with and pray. And someone can pray out loud if they, if they feel led to. Uh, maybe you're kind of uncomfortable in that. Just gather together and just say, hey, let's pray. You, you know, you can even sing while we pray. And, um, but we want to saturate this place, this sanctuary, with prayer. Because if anything is going to bring revival, it's prayer in our attitude of prayer, attitude of our heart. We have to be sold out for Christ. We have to be humbled, and we have to pray. So this morning, as we, as we begin this next song, just, just find someone in your area or whatever. Maybe you feel like walking across the, to someone else. That's fine, too. But we want to just take some time to pray during this, during this song. And when you're done, just continue singing with us, and, um, and we'll just sing about God's love and how it never fails. But 
You have new mercy for me every day. Your love never fails. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rain, Sing it out, you stay. Sing it out. Yes, you make all things work together for my good. And you make all things work together for my good. Let's declare it. Yes, you here we're seeking your face we're seeking revival father we want change and father wherever that change is whatever it needs to take place father help it to begin in my life with me that I would change to who you want me to be and I would follow you and follow your will and I pray Lord as a congregation we would pray that prayer and that we would seek your face father you gave your life on a cross your son Jesus gave his life for my sins and for the sins of each and every one in here. And Lord, this morning, help us to reflect on that and just where we were at and, and our walk with you and, and where we were lost. And Lord, we were in the miry clay and the muck and all the junk, Father, that was there. And you've taken it away. And you've made us clean. And it's by your blood of 
that we are washed white as snow. We praise you, Father. this morning we brought a lot of baggage in here with us from the world and we just pray that as we worship you now that we'll clear our minds we'll prepare our hearts to worship you that your holy spirit will speak to us and that we'll respond to you the way we should we thank you for your many blessings and fathers we bring our tithes and offerings to you we ask that you bless it for your kingdom in jesus precious name we pray
Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. One more time. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And thank you, Lord, for paying the price that we could not pay, paying our debt with, with your blood. We could never pay you back, and we're not trying to. With these offerings, these tithes, Lord, we just say thank you. We understand that everything we have belongs to you. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless each of us as we give just a little bit, not to pay you back, not to earn your favor, not to um, earn brownie points with God or anything like that, but because we just love you and because we know it's yours anyway. Lord, I pray that you would take the tithes and the offerings that have been invested into our ministry, and I pray that you would use it in a great way to fund to, to th these investments that people are making uh, to fund the gospel being, being proclaimed all over the world. And Lord, I pray that um, you would bless our church. I pray that you would help each one of us to really come to grips with who we are in you, realizing that we have been forgiven. You paid our sin debt. We don't have to walk around with guilt and shame and, and all that. We belong to you. You've saved us. You've forgiven us. You're our Father, and we love you, and we praise you, and we pray that you've been pleased with our singing and with our giving. And now that you would be pleased with the teaching and the preaching of your word, that you would open up our hearts to respond to what's being said. In Jesus' name, amen. Last Sunday night, there was a big to-do in Hollywood. They threw out the red carpet, and they slapped each other on the back at the annual um, Academy Awards ceremony. Anybody watch it? I didn't. Couldn't care less. But... I found out that Leonardo DiCaprio won the Oscar, finally, after being snubbed for all of his great performances in other uh, movies. And uh, this year he won the Oscar uh, for a movie whose name I don't even know what it means, but uh, Revenant or something like that. I've not seen it, don't care about it. But during his acceptance speech, um, of course he did the normal thinking of the, 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 you know, this person and that person, but um, he addressed his pet issue. Of course, his pet issue is what is in vogue, what is socially acceptable, what is the, the big pet issue of many Hollywood types, and that is the issue of global warming. And um, now you may or may not have strong feelings about global warming. Uh, I don't, again, I don't really care, but uh, I don't care about his views that much. But, but, I'm, but I'm impressed with this guy, this young man. He's still young, still looks like a kid to me. Um, I'm impressed that he would take this time to talk about what was really, really important to him. And here's what he said. Climate change is real, in his opinion. Climate change is real. It's happening right now. It's the most urgent threat facing our entire species. Now, clearly he's not book, read the book of Revelation, so he doesn't really know what the real threat facing our species is. But he believes that climate change is that important. And he, says, he goes on to say, we need to work collectively together and stop procrastinating. He is so dedicated to this issue, he has donated 30 million of his own dollars to fight climate change. Now, um, that's a lot of money. I don't care how rich you are. $30 million is a lot of money. He's definitely put his money where his mouth is. He is a vocal and passionate person. He's totally committed to his cause. Let me ask you a question. Is there a cause that you're dedicated to like that? Is there a cause that you're that dedicated that if you had 30 million extra dollars, you'd spend your money on that? We have been talking about reaching up, reaching out, reaching in, in this sermon series. This church exists to reach up to God through prayer and praise. And that has been my teaching so far in 2016. We've only gotten to the reaching up part, really. Praising the Lord. Your throat should be hoarse from worshiping Christ passionately this morning, praying to him. We also exist to reach out to the community with the gospel. 
Now that could be through concerts or block parties, feedings, um, <clears throat> sports outreach, go evangelism, going out and canvassing, ESL ministry, which we've done in the past, service projects, mission trips, revival services, reaching out to people who need Jesus. That's what we're going to talk about today. We also exist to reach inward, discipling believers through Bible studies on Sundays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and other times by providing fellowship opportunities like the War Room movie we did recently or the, the, base, the softball team, the basketball team, the, the Men's Ignite Conference that we still have tickets to if you want to go. Um, things like that, fellowship opportunities. So in 2016, we are praying for revival at Kingsland Baptist Church when it comes to reaching up, reaching out, and reaching in. And we desperately need it. What is revival? Well, I'll remind you, revival is a major spiritual transformation. Revival is a spiritual anointing that only God can pour out on us. We came to the altar and we prayed for it last week. We prayed in groups for it this week. We have an invitation to pray in a little bit. We'll do heart cleansing and, and, and introspection and, and self-examination with the Lord's Supper, all in an attempt to, to, to be clean vessels, holy vessels, open vessels, saying, Lord, bring revival. I'm praying for revival where people who are far from God come to faith in Christ because people like you and me share the good news with them everywhere we go. I feel strongly led today to transition, at least for today. We might go back to reaching up because it's been great and it's important. And the truth is, if you're not reaching up and you're not connected to Christ, you're not passionately excited about him, you're not going to be of much use as far as propagating the gospel. But I feel strongly led to shift gears today and talk about reaching out. Remember what Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. Break that into parts. Let your light so shine, that's worship, that the Lord may see your good deeds, that's ministry, that the world will see your good deeds and then glorify your Father in heaven. That's evangelism. This is the believer's job description. And I want to say it that way. The believer's job description, and I mean it as a job, as a task. Um, it's hard work. Evangelism is hard work. It doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come easy. It is hard. Now, when, when it goes well, it's, it's one of the coolest things in the world. I remember the first time I talked to Jenny Melton. I said, Jenny. I didn't know her name. I was in a line paying for a bill. And I gave her my card and I said, I'd like to invite you to my church. I do that all the time. I did it yesterday. I do it, I do it regularly. It's never happened like this before because she looked back at me and said, that's awesome. I just got saved last night and I'm looking for a church. You remember that? <laughs> I was like, what? Are you, are, are you high? Is this some sort of joke? Who's messing with me, you know? And then there's four or five people behind me in line, but she kept talking. She's like, I love Jesus. I'm so excited about God. Give me some tracks. I'm going to put them out here on the altar, at the, on the counter. And, and, and I'm like embarrassed because there's people waiting to pay for their bill, but she was so excited about God. I was so glad I invited her to church that day. I wish it went like that every single time. It doesn't go that way every single time, does it? But when God's working, he does awesome things. We're supposed to be faithful. We can't uh, worry about the results of everything. We've been given a job to do, and it really is hard work. It's our privilege to glorify God by representing him well in this life. Now, the text we're going to turn, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The text we're going to read today talks about being an ambassador. You are an ambassador. I am an ambassador. And there are no more job titles we need than that. Deacon, pastor, teacher, member. Listen, if you're a Christian, forget about all those other titles. You are an ambassador. Ambassador, you're a representative of Christ, and it's hard work. It's our privilege to glorify God by representing Him in this life as ambassadors. Let's read about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 14. And I will acknowledge to you, I have preached this passage before. I've never preached this sermon before. I've taught about this topic before, but I've never, this is fresh, and I, wanna, I want you to know the Lord has put this heavy on my heart to share with you. I'm going to try not to mess it up too much. Uh, it's going to take a little while, so, so please dial in with me. And ask yourself, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And if I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be do, doing, when am I going to start doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Because I hope nobody's going, oh, I've heard this one before. You know, I don't get mad when people sleep in church. If you see someone sleeping in church, don't judge them. I'm not mad at them. It's probably my fault or maybe medication. I don't know. But, but I'm going to try not to bore you to death with stuff you already know, but my, my question for you today is, 
Will you do what you're supposed to do? It, when will you start doing what you're supposed to do? And I'm not standing up here as a perfect example. I can think of plenty of times I went to that same restaurant and didn't say boo about God. Other times I did. Um, it's not just, look, it, it's a responsibility. It's a job. It's a task. And as with so many other tasks, it's so rewarding when you do it, but it's hard work, and sometimes it's scary. But it's the love of Christ that compels us in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. The love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. We're going to take Lord's Supper today. It's not about it's particularly his... It's a, it's, a, um, it's a metaphorical act. We're remembering his body, we're remembering his blood, but it meant so much more. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. He's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Why, where do I get off saying this is your job description? Because the word of God, based on the authority of the word of God, this is your job description. You have been given the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Aren't you thankful that he's not counting your trespasses because Jesus paid it all. He shed his blood to wash away your sins and entrusting to us that message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now look, we've done faith evangelism, we've done every believer a witness, we've done Operation Chesterfield, we've done um, Way of the Master, and, and, and if, if you wanna get the video and write those things down later, those are all really great witnessing tools and techniques. There's a really short one right there. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to four words. That's a really great witnessing tool right there. Go tell people, hey, man, you need to be reconciled to God. It doesn't take a fancy program. In fact, I'd rather not be involved in some fancy memorized spiel. I'd rather just tell people about Jesus and say, look what he did for me. He'll do it for you. You can be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him, that's Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This should be your cause. This should be my cause. Oh boy, we're talking about building, building, making refurbishments to the children's wing. We're talking about outreach events, new programs, feeding, using the Family Life Center to feed people. We've got all kinds of ideas. But our, it all comes down to be reconciled to God our job, our ministry, is to share the gospel with people who need it. That's what we do. Whatever vehicle, if we want to buy a new bus to pick up kids to do that, if, if we want to uh, change the carpet to make it prettier to do that, or, or build a new building, or, or whatever it is God leads us to do, it, it, it's all for that purpose. That should be our cause, not, not all the stuff in the middle. All the other stuff, just paying the bills, uh, dealing with the, the, the details. It's all about helping people get reconciled to God. That should be my cause. That should be your cause. If someone asks me, who are you? What do you do? I shouldn't say I'm a pastor. I should say I'm an ambassador. What? What country do you represent? Oh, really? You want to know where I'm from and who I represent? Let me tell you. That'd be a great way to start getting into conversations when people ask you what you do for a living. There are countless examples of people who promote their cause, and I felt necessary to share a few with you. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio. Another one happened last summer when the ESPY Awards got hijacked by a former Olympic champion and former American hero who decided he wants to become a female. Caitlyn Jenner is very vocal, very proud, and very proactive. Are you? Are you proud and vocal about anything? This person is. Now, years ago, we would have thought, that's not normal. Something's wrong with that. Now, our world is so screwed up and so mixed around. If you were one of the ones that think that dude dressed up in a dress, there's something wrong with that and something weird about that, you're not normal. That's 
how whacked out our culture is. Not that we should be hateful or shoot him or, or hurt him or anything like that, but, but that's a little weird. I want my kids to think that's a little weird. That makes you a bigot if you think that's a little weird. How dare you think it's weird for a man to dress up like a, like a woman and go on television and, and talk about courage and win the Courage Award. But the bottom line is, Caitlyn Jenner is very proactive about a cause, transgenderism. What cause are you excited about? George Harrison was one of the original Beatles and uh, one of the most famous and influential musicians of the 20th century. In his chart-topping 1970 song, My Sweet Lord, Harrison devised a choral line singing the Hebrew praise, Hallelujah. Who's heard it? Who's heard it? I've not heard it. Man, a lot of people have heard it. I heard it the other day, and it got my attention. I was kind of, Hallelujah. Well, it gets a little weird there toward the end, though, doesn't it? Um, that common Christian word, hallelujah, it's in a lot of religions. It's the, same, it's the same word in every language, hallelujah, which means praise the Lord. Later in the song, after an instrumental break, the voices return, now chanting the first 12 words of the Hare Krishna mantra, known more reverentially as the, um, the Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, which I feel a little weird saying right now. Um, but when you do it at the right pace with the song going, it all sounds cool. I mean, that's the number one song in 1970 in Britain. These Sanskrit words are the main mantra of the Hare Krishna faith, which Harrison, with which Harrison identified. This mantra is composed of th three Sanskrit names of the Supreme Being, Hare, Krishna, and Rama. George... Harrison was proselytizing, folks. He was an evangelist. He was recruiting converts. Harrison explained later that he intended uh, repeating and alternating hallelujah and Hare Krishna to show that the, the two terms meant quite the same thing, in his opinion. As well as to have listeners chanting the mantra before they knew what was going on. And I just saw some folks doing it the other day. This man was so committed to his religion that he basically tricked people into to singing along to a worship tune. He was unashamed of his faith. And I've got nothing bad to say about George Harrison. Honestly, I, I, you know, that's not the point of bringing it up. In fact, he got with the uh, traveling Wilburys a few years later, and I, I think some of their stuff was really cool. But he was an evangelist for what he believed in. George Clooney, Don Henley, um, other celebrities who support their causes, each of them th th to the point of being annoying and, and uh, weird a lot of times. They, how about these six? I think there's still six candidates left for president, aren't there? Six of them who unashamedly push their views on everything. They, they, they promote their agenda at each debate. People promote their agenda, right? Their home businesses, their kids, their clubs and their trips that they want you to pay for them to go on. Their preferred politician. People promote all kinds of things. Their favorite sport teams, their hobbies, their favorite band, their causes. I mean, I almost got sideways with some of you for even questioning George Harrison because you've got your band you're into or whatever. My question is this. Why are we not more vocal about the gospel? Especially when we understand it is our number one job description. Now, let me get real practical. You have a bulletin in your hand. Last week we had a bulletin that talked about mission trips and all kinds of stuff. This one talks about the extravaganza. It's also inviting you to come back tonight for a short business meeting and a, 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 an in-depth prayer. We're having a call to prayer tonight. Be back at 6.30. In fact, Tom and Cindy Melvin are going to give us a little devotional about prayer. You'll want to be back tonight for that. Um, there are all kinds of opportunities that we've put together for you to be an ambassador. Trips to Lithuania, Baltimore, four of them planned for this year, Chincoteague with fa fa Fusion Family mission trips, Monroe Park, 
what's mostly on my mind right now is our extravaganza, which will be here Easter weekend on Saturday. And then we're bringing in this band, Light the Sky, on Easter Sunday. And these are fantastic opportunities to invite your friends to church or your friends who used to go to church and need to get back into church. These are fantastic opportunities for you to serve and to be part of reaching out to our community. Go Outreach will happen the Sunday right before Easter. We'll go canvassing, we'll go prayer walking for Easter, for the extravaganza, for the revival that's coming up. Will you go? Will you take your ambassadorship seriously? And it could be so many things. Um, uh, coming, uh, inviting your, your, a friend to your Bible study class or to this worship service or a kid to Awana or to the collision youth things. Um, it could be using your email or your Twitter or your Facebook just to tell people about Jesus. Um, handing out personal invitations, promoting Easter, um, whatever. Passing out a flyer. We'll make flyers available to you starting next week. The question is this, will you take your job seriously? It's our job. It's what we've been tasked to do. In closing this morning, I want to read through the text and offer a few insights. And then I'm going to ask you to prepare your heart for Lord's Supper and, and, and ask you, will you reach out somehow, however God's leading you to do? And it's different for everybody, but, but there's different ministries we either can or can't do based on you reaching out. Um, Donna Edmonds came and gave an impassioned plea to our class this morning about the choir. If we're going to keep a choir, we need more people to come and be part of it, more men specifically. We've actually had several ladies sign up, which is awesome. But it's to that point. Um, if we're going to have a bus ministry, we're going to have to have people to drive the buses. If we're going to have an Awana ministry, we're going to have to have people work in Awana. Or if we're going to reach any young families, that's why we're beefing up the, the children's area, we're going to have to have people who will watch their children in, in, in nursery and will serve them in, in, the, um, in, the, in the Sunday school classes and so forth. I don't know what God specifically is calling you to do or to change or to start or whatever. I'm just asking we you open your mind to it. And, and then that's church stuff. Specifically, when we walk out these doors, are we looking for opportunities to share the gospel or not? And, and you know what? I pray for that. Lord, give me an opportunity. And it seems like every time I pray for that, it's amazing. He gives me an opportunity to share the gospel. Will you pray that prayer? Lord, give me an opportunity to share my faith with somebody. Not to be pushy, not to trick them into singing some weird song about Krishna. I mean, that seems so bizarre to me, but it worked. Even bizarre things will work better than doing nothing. But it's the love of Christ. Look back at verse 14. That controls us, compels us, motivates us. Not me giving you a guilt speech about you need to do this and that and the other. That's not really helpful. The love of Christ, when you really understand and embrace all of his love for you, in the relationship that you can have with him. Man, it's something you want to share with others. And I'm assuming George Harrison, who was probably, I don't know if he grew up poor, but he, he all this wealth with the, the Beatles and all this fame and all that, and he found it empty. And at least he found some meaning in the transcendental meditation and, and some religious, some higher power, more than just money and, and sex and drugs and rock and roll. Unfortunately, he didn't really find the real thing, did he? The love of Christ, the Son of God, compels us. Let me ask you a question this morning. Who or what is controlling you? Is it anger? Is it regret? Is it money? Is it a, is it a, a chemical addiction to something or a psychological addiction to something? Is it the love of Christ? I hope so. I mean, that, that should be our motivation. Because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all. Now remember, it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So when you're sharing the love of Jesus and the gospel with somebody, man, you're, you're, you're doing something he wants you to do, and you're telling him a message that he wants that person to hear, and he wants that person to hear it and to repent. He loves us all. He died for us all. He will save the souls of all who ask for it. He died for all, in verse 15, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him. And isn't that our problem? Somewhere along the line, we thought, if I could just get this, or if I could just do that, or, I want to live for me. I'm tired of your rules. I'm going to go out and do what I want to do. Or, you know, and, and we thought, if I could just have what I wanted to have, do what I wanted to do, I'll be happy. 
But the, the, the weird, it's so counterintuitive because it doesn't make you happy. It makes you miserable. And the best way to be happy, to have true joy, is, is to lay down your life to live for God. Don't live for yourselves. Live for him who for their sake died and was raised. So for the believer, the purpose behind living is not wrapped into selfish wrapped up in selfish ambition or accumulation of wealth or conveniences or success. It should only be to simply live for Jesus. From the moment of conversion, moving forward, our goal, our aim, our purpose must just be to give him glory alone. So verse 15, from now on, therefore, regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. He wasn't just a man. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. So the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That's why I always like that, that saying, that slogan, God never saved anyone he didn't change. As Baptists, we hold on to eternal security tightly. You can't lose your salvation. But the sad fact is there's a whole lot of people out there that never had it. They never repented. They never truly knew the Lord. If you're a believer, you're different. You have hope, you have peace, you have forgiveness, intimacy with God, the very God who created you. In verse 18, all this is from God. Isn't that amazing? All this is from God. He chose us. He gets all the credit. We get none. He did all the saving. All we did was got lost. That's the only thing necessary to get saved is to be lost, to be rescued. The only thing necessary to have your eyes open to see is to admit you're blind. We brought nothing to the table. It was all him. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, which is why we're here today. That's our job description. This is not just for ministers or pastors or, or, or short-term missionaries or retired missionaries who aren't really retired, missionaries who have come home for a little while. It's for all of us. For me, and for you, and for your children, and for, your, 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 for the senior citizens, and for the young and the old, the rich and the poor, whatever. It's for every one of us. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their transgressions and their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us this message. Isn't that amazing? He entrusted us a message. Parents, don't we entrust different tasks to our children? Now, whether or not they do them, you know. One task I've grown to love to entrust to my son is the litter box. Oh, I hate that thing. I've entrusted it to someone else. And thankfully, the Lord doesn't give us a whole lot of jobs like that, right? I mean, there's some rough jobs out there. But we've been entrusted with this job, and it's a lot better than messing around with a nasty litter box. We've been entrusted with the gospel, and entrusting to us this message of reconciliation. And for some reason, I have the vision, the, the thought of Paul Revere just driving around. The British are coming. The British are coming. We've been given, we've been entrusted that job. What if he had failed? Judgment is coming. Jesus is coming. Folks, get ready, world. Prepare yourselves. Yes, yeah, some people are going to laugh at you. Yes, yeah, some people are going to dismiss you as a religious nut. Who cares? Everything you believe in your whole eternal security and your every about God and eternity is wrapped up into this. It's certainly important enough to share the message of reconciliation. Therefore, in verse 20, with everything in mind, we are ambassadors. What's an ambassador? An ambassador is a representative for someone very important, typically from a faraway place. That's what you are. That's what I am. We are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, I don't know who God has lined up for you to tell that to this week or this month. I, I don't know how you're exactly you should say it. But I think it would be a tremendous, it would be such a sad thing for a person, for a Christian to live his whole life and never tell that to somebody. And some of you are scared to death, and you probably feel guilty. Oh, man, I've, I've not done, you know, I should have told more people about Jesus, or I should have come to church more frequently, or I should have done this, I should have done that. 
Listen, you can't change the past. You can ask the Lord to forgive you for whatever disobedience is in your past. And isn't it great to know that he'll, he won't hold it against you? It just said that a minute ago. He won't hold your trespasses against you. But today, I am freshly reminding you in the year 2016 that I've been given a job, you've been given a job, it's our job, and it's our task, it's hard work. But man, it is a privilege, it is an honor to glorify God by representing him well in this life. And I, and I don't mean that just in the sense of sharing the gospel. Obviously, you need to represent him well in, in every area of your life before you start spouting off about God to everybody and they go, who is this crazy dude that, that you need to live out your faith. But if you're waiting to be perfect, if you're waiting to be, have it all together and have all the answers, you're never going to share the gospel. And it doesn't matter whether you're young or old, a widow, divorced. Um, whatever your position is, if you're a Christian, this is, your, this is your job description. And I want to encourage you to tell somebody about Jesus. And by the way, when it says be reconciled to God, it implies that there's a problem. When you say, hey, um, uh, John, be reconciled to God. That implies that he has a problem. In fact, the word reconciliation comes to mind when you have enemies, people on separate sides of the fence, and you've had a, 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 he's an enemy. And there's a confrontation, and you have to make up. Be reconciled to God. I had a situation recently where someone, certainly not an enemy, but someone who um, did some things they shouldn't have done. They wronged me. And, and this, this isn't me imagining it. Believe me, they wronged me. They wronged my uh, family or whatever. And I finally confronted the person yesterday, knowing that I had to preach this message about, you know, loving people and telling people about Jesus and reconciling. And I thought, man, I don't want to mess this up. I certainly wouldn't be telling you the story if I had. This man looked at me. It has nothing to do with our church. It's nobody you know, Okay. But it was just a thing that happened. And I had to confront him. It wasn't the kind of thing where I could get around confronting. I didn't want, I hate confrontation. But I said, um, this happened. And he knew. What's worse, he doesn't speak English very good. Well, maybe I'm the one who doesn't speak English very good. So I'd actually written a little thing up detailing what happened, and I left it there, and a few days later, I'm... Walking back, and oh, how's this going to go? And you know what he said? The first, before I could say anything, he said, I'm so sorry. That's what he said. I'm so sorry. And it was resolved. And I still don't know 90% of what he said. So the other weird things could happen from this point because we weren't really communicating that great. But it meant so much to me. I love it when it goes well like that. I love it when it goes smoothly. It doesn't always go smoothly, does it? There are difficult people in your life. I realize this. I'm not foolish. There are difficult people in my life, believe it or not. We've got to love them, and we've got to be willing to confront them and say, hey, be reconciled to God. This admonition implies that people have a problem. They have an enemy, and there are other passages in the New Testament that basically say God is their enemy. Until, you re until you're reconciled, God is your enemy. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's just the gospel. Jesus Christ put our sin on him on the cross. He paid it all. He was buried and he rose from the grave. So in closing, will you take your job seriously this morning? I can think of so many examples of being an ambassador. I had an opportunity the other day to be an ambassador where it was uncomfortable. And um, man, we should be willing to share the gospel with people who are different race, uh, seem to be more prestigious, more educated, or people that may be homeless. We should share the gospel with anybody who'll listen to it. And you never know who's going to receive it. You never know who's going to accept it. I had an opportunity on um, Friday. I, I was at a store and I was purchasing some things. And, and the individual in front of me just captured my attention. And I can't forget her. And, and for some reason, she's been on my mind. I'm, I'm praying that I'll have another encounter with her at some point. But this, this individual was extremely deformed. And my heart went out to her. I think sometimes we just feel sorry. You see someone on the, the side of the road, you feel sorry for them. Someone broken down, someone homeless, someone uh, who, you know, whatever, in a, in a bad way, you feel sorry for someone. And I felt that immediately. And it was, it was such a, a, an extreme thing that I didn't know whether I should look her in the eye or not look or not engage her. It was, it was a little, 
it was a little uncomfortable. And the thought occurred to me, that's every single interaction in her life. Every single person she deals with in her life, her life must be so hard. And I did my best just to talk to her and to treat her like a person, like someone who's important. And she was important to me. I wanted to connect with her some way, somehow, and, and to encourage her just a little bit. And we chatted back and forth. Her deformity is so strong that I couldn't really understand what she was saying because her mouth doesn't operate properly. And, um, man, and, and as I'm walking, I thought, you know what? I reached in my pocket, and I pulled out my business card, and I said, here, I'm the pastor of this church. I want you to come to my church sometime. And if she was here this morning, I probably wouldn't be telling the story. I hope she does come someday, and I hope she's received well. And, and all that, but when I walked away from that, I thought, man, we look on the outside so much. We're so insecure. We're such wimps. Get over yourself and quit worrying about what the other person looks like or what they're going to say to you. Just share the gospel with them or invite them to Easter or invite them to church or, or, or get into a conversation with them about what's important in their life. And if we would look, if we would learn to see people the way Jesus sees people, he sees her as a precious creation who he died to save. I don't know if she's saved or not. He wants her to be his, his little girl, and he loves her just as much as he loves you or me or your grandkids or my kids. There's so many examples of being an ambassador. A smile, a kind response when someone's a little testy with you. Showing a little patience with someone who should know better. That guy should know better. Yeah, he does, but he got a little testy. Show some patience, some grace. Share your testimony. Notice I haven't given you any slogans or acrostics, or I told you some websites you'd go to, but that's not that important compared to just open up and share the gospel. Share with them about what God did for you. And listen, if you don't have a story yet to share, you might want to ask yourself this morning, do I need to be saved? Do I need to be born again? Do I need to be reconciled to God, the one who took <clears throat> my sin and put upon his son Jesus on the cross and paid for all of it? It could be handing out a tract or going on a visit or making a call or having a lunch meeting or giving an invitation to a special church service, offering someone a ride or assistance of some, some kind or money with a need they have or food. And the list is so much longer that I'm embarrassed giving that little list, but we've got to finish. I'm just asking you, will you take seriously your responsibility to be an ambassador? It's our job description, and it's our privilege to glorify God by representing him well in this life. So as we come to our time of invitation and prepare our hearts for Lord's Supper, if you've been negligent, listen, join the club. We all have. Let's be honest. But it doesn't have to be that way. And, and you remember that starfish story, the kids throwing the starfish, one starfish after the next? You've heard the story, I hope. One of his smart aleck friends come and says, hey, man, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. There's so many starfish on the beach. You can't rescue them all. And the little boy reaches up one and he says, but I rescued this one. It makes a difference for this one. And who is that one person out there that, that maybe your whole life has converged to this point as an adult, as a teenager, that... that I mean, I remember, I remember sharing the gospel and leading a boy to Christ when I was just a child in my bedroom. It's a very distant memory. I remember his name. And to be honest with you, I don't know if it really stuck because we're Facebook friends now and he's pretty wild. So. But I remember sharing the gospel with that boy. And I remember him praying to receive Christ. It's a long time ago. I thought I was too young for that. You're not too young for that. And you're not too old for that. So pray about the lost friends and lost loved ones that God wants you to share the gospel with and engage them with the gospel this week. Pray for witnessing opportunities. Would you pray with me now? As we prepare our hearts for Lord's Supper, we are going to celebrate, we're going to memorialize what he did for us, but we're also going to be remember, remind, mindful of the fact that he said, do this until I come back. And when he comes back, that opportunity is gone. The, the age of grace, the church age is over. So we have people that we rub shoulders with each and every day that need Jesus. If you want to come and pray at the altar today or pray where you are or whatever it is you want to do, pray for your lost friends and loved ones and engage them. Pray for courage to engage them with the gospel. Pray for witnessing opportunity. That is a very direct invitation. If you need to be saved, come forward and let me pray with you. I'll show you how you can be born again 
All you have to do is ask the Lord to forgive you and believe in him and his finished work on the cross and his resurrection. Man, we're getting ready for Easter. Listen, that's Resurrection Sunday. That's every day around here. We should be so fired up for it. And, and, and I, I, I do want to ask you, Kingsland people, please get behind what we're doing to reach this community with the extravaganza. Sign up for something and be here and bring your friends. And the most convenient time ever to come to church is on Easter. We have two services, 9.30 and 11. Pray for that. Come back and pray tonight for revival and for your church. But right now, I want to ask you to pray for your lost friends. And I'm praying for mine and for your loved ones. I lost another loved one this year. It, it breaks my heart. Listen, the, the opportunities will come to, uh, there will come a time when you don't have the opportunity anymore. I can remember desperately wanting to share my faith as a teenager, and I did. I invited a lot of my friends to church, and a lot of them came, and it was awesome. But I can think of so many. I can think of one in particular. I was just intimidated. I was afraid. I was, this is 20 three or years ago and I didn't want this person to think I was a nerd. I didn't want to mess things up and, and, and you know what? That opportunity came and went. Maybe the Lord will open up another opportunity and be for share the gospel, but I, 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 and he hasn't. See, we have opportunities right now. Teenagers, you have opportunities right now. They're going to come and they're going to go and there's never going to be really that open window again. Don't neglect those opportunities. Don't miss it. Pray for your lost friends right now. Pray for your loved ones. And, and, and ask the Lord for courage to engage them with the gospel this week. So, Lord, I pray that you do that. I pray that you give me witnessing opportunities today. Right now, you've given me one, and I thank you for it. But, but Lord, if I don't share my faith when I'm off this stage, I have no right to share it when I'm on it. And neither do the rest of us. Lord, this needs to be the passion of our lives. This needs to be our job description as Christians. So today, Lord, we pray for our lost friends. We pray for our loved ones. You know exactly who they are, and Lord, you know who I'm thinking about right now. I pray that you would save their souls, and I pray that you'd give me the courage to engage them with the gospel, and I pray that you'd give me witnessing opportunities, and I pray that for every open-hearted Christian in this room. And Lord, right now, as we have this invitation, it's an invitation to pray, to pray for courage to share the gospel, to pray for witnessing opportunities, and to pray for our lost loved ones. And we pray that you would answer those prayers in a real and specific way. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand and sing.
Lord said, this is my body offered up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. And today we've been reminded of his awesome love for us. His atonement purchased on that cross. And our obligation, our duty, our privilege to share that message with other people. Go out and do it this week, okay? Be back tonight. We're going to have a sweet, sweet call to prayer, 6.30 night. Come back, please. We love you, Lord. We truly appreciate your grace and your mercy. We didn't deserve it, but you gave it to us anyway. And, Lord, I thank you for that in my life. And we thank you for that as the church, your church, those who have been called out, those who have been forgiven. This community, today we've celebrated communion, communion with you but also communion with one another. Lord, I pray that our community 
would be strong, that our fellowship would be strong, that our love for you would be red hot and our love for each other would be equally so. And I pray that you would take us out of here ambassadors who are truly grateful to represent our king from a far country in this dark and dying world who desperately needs to hear the good news. Lord, give us the courage to do it. Please open up the opportunities, the doors. And Lord, I pray for a special anointing, a special blessing on our uh, outreach efforts this month, Easter weekend, to reach this community for Christ with our extravaganza on Saturday and our services on Sunday morning. Lord, I pray that many, many folks would come and many would be saved. And Lord, we look forward to the revival services, but Lord, really, we're praying for revival, not services. Lord, we're praying for a fresh touch, a fresh anointing in this church where we are set on fire to praise you, to proclaim your love to live our lives as ambassadors for your glory. We pray these things in the mighty and awesome and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.